William Wu walked into the lecture room on the sixth floor of the Menzies building at Monash University for his econometrics class and sat down. It was late in October and he was to get his results from a small assignment that his lecturer, Dr. Gordon Brown, had given them a month before. William knew he'd done well on the assignment and was looking forward to finishing his honours degree in business in the next few weeks. William's friend Stephen came in and the two began chatting a little, ready for the tutorial to take place. William could feel the eyes of his classmate Alan on his back. That wasn't unusual. Alan had taken a real dislike to him in the past couple of years, even complaining to lecturers about him. William had just tried to help him. They were both from China and he knew what it was like to be in a foreign country. Dr. Lee Gordon Brown walked to the front of the room and said hello to the 12 students gathered. He then handed out the marked assignments and William was happy to see that he received the result he wanted. Things were looking good for the end of his degree. Dr. Gordon Brown wrote a question on the whiteboard and the class settled into a discussion for the next 15 minutes or so about it. Suddenly, behind William, Alan stood up on his desk and screamed at William, You never understand me! What do I have to do? It was like everything was in slow motion. The class screamed as Alan cocked his CZ 9mm handgun, pointed at William and pulled the trigger. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something and every week we present, for your satisfaction, two episodes in true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so that you can get notified every time we release a new video. Our videos are also available in audio form on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whichever podcast platform uh, is your favourite. The shooting at Monash University's Clayton campus in October 2002 is the only school shooting in Australian history. When we Australians think about school shootings, we usually look towards the Americans after their history with Columbine, Georgia Tech and Sandy Hook. We never expected it to happen here. Huan Yun Zhang was a commerce student at Monash University for nearly four years. The anglicised version of his name was Alan, and that's how we'll refer to him in this narrative, although he only changed it to Alan once he moved to Australia. Alan was born in 1966 in the Guangdong province in southern China to his mother, Zhu Guang, and his father, who has not been named. He had a lonely childhood. During most of his years at school, he spoke little and spent most of his time by himself. His mother later described him as having quite a short temper. After high school, Alan attended university and completed a degree in acupuncture and practiced for a good few years. In 1993, Alan's father was diagnosed with bone cancer and was nursed by Alan for 12 months before he died. The two were very close and soon after, Alan attempted suicide at work. He never practiced acupuncture again. Alan's mother, Zhu Guang, said that that was the first time she'd noticed Alan having any sort of psychiatric issue. In 1996, several years after his father's death, Alan and his mother moved to Australia for a fresh start. Alan was 30 years old and was eager to start again in a place where other family members had lived successful lives. Alan and his mother settled in Melbourne's southeast and lived together in an apartment in Clayton opposite the famous Monash University. Neighbours described the two as very quiet and that they kept to themselves. In 1999, Alan enrolled in a Bachelor of Commerce degree at Monash's Clayton campus. Alan was 10 years older than the rest of the students in the class and was ignored by the majority of the class due to this and his heavy accent. He understood and could speak English very well, but his accent affected his ability to discuss things with fellow students or potential friends. Alan also spoke very quickly, which impaired his communication abilities. He grew impatient with other people for not understanding him and would often lash out in tutorials. That being said, he was considered to be an excellent student, bright, and he got good results from his exams and assignments. In the year 2000, Alan started to believe that two students in particular were conspiring against him. He thought that Chinese national Zhu Hui Wu, also known as William Wu, and William's friend Stephen Chan were influencing other people on campus, including the teaching staff. 
William would actually help Alan with his assignments, becoming a bit of a conduit between Alan's Chinese background and this Monash faculty. William had a lot of friends, and his girlfriend He Ling Nui thought that Alan might have been jealous of this. Towards the end of 2001, Alan was accepted as an honours student in commerce at Monash University, meaning an extra year on his degree, taking the total to four years, and another year in lectures and tutorials with William Wu and Stephen Chan. In 2002, Alan stopped talking to William altogether. He also escalated emails to teaching staff, accusing William of talking about him behind his back. Teachers said that the emails were unusual, but not particularly the most unusual emails that they'd ever had from a student. Alan's emails also mentioned that other students, like Stephen Chan, hated him or were trying to kill him. These allegations were not taken seriously, because there was no evidentiary basis to any of them. The university did not try to engage much with Alan outside of recommending the university psychiatrist to discuss his situation. Alan visited the campus psychiatrist for treatment and also informed the psychiatrist about William Wu turning other students against him. He maintained that William was the godfather of Manash University and believed he was the representative of all evil across the world. The psychiatrist did not recommend any medication or treatment to Alan, instead relying on allowing Alan to just vent his frustrations to them. Alan's mother Zhu said later that Alan believed William Wu envied him and insulted him and laughed when he made a presentation in class. Alan called him a mad dog and often watched him from the window as William lived opposite the Zhangs. Zhu also said that Alan didn't have many friends and mostly stayed in his bedroom. In April 2002, Alan joined the Melbourne Indoor Pistol Club and obtained membership in the Sporting Shooters Association of Australia, which was based in the nearby suburb of Springvale. This led him to acquire a handgun license in June. Over the coming months, he purchased seven handguns, including a CZ 9mm and multiple Beretta handguns, and visited the shooting club in Springvale on 40 separate occasions. In October, Alan was getting towards the end of his honours degree and was to present an oral dissertation in class later in the month. A senior lecturer raised concerns about the emotional and mental stability of Alan on the 8th of October after Alan exploded with emotion in a way he'd never seen after he corrected Alan's grammar in front of the class. On the 11th of October, during a classroom presentation, Alan told his honours year supervisor, Gail Martin, about his fear of other students in class, telling her that he'd already spoken to Professor Brett Inder that he believed if he looked at students in a certain way, they would kill him. Concerned he might have problems that teaching staff were not qualified enough to identify, Gail expressed concerns to the other teaching staff about Alan's mental state at a lunch on the 14th of October. She said that Alan was paranoid, gruff and abrupt, and muttered to himself in class. Other staff agreed, calling Alan a strange kettle of fish. There were also reports that Gail said to other teaching staff that Alan seemed to harbour a simmering frustration. Whether those reports were true or not, those simmering frustrations were about to boil over. On the morning of the 21st of October, Alan wrote a note and left it stuck to his wardrobe. Using the acronym WW to refer to William Wu, the note read, Just pick up a gun, kill all the WWs, and there are no WWs anymore. To kill WWs is the responsibility defined in my destiny. The note also referred to William Wu trying to kill Alan legally. The note also mentioned the government, saying, Please don't tighten gun control. I anticipate you certainly tighten gun control, and say I am mad. It continued, How many hate are there in my bullets? You just cannot imagine. He arrived at Monash University's Clayton campus at approximately 11am, wearing a jacket, and sat at the back of the lecture room E659 on the 6th floor of the Menzies building. The Menzies building is the biggest on the Monash University Clayton campus, and contained around 2,000 people on this morning. To pass the time, Alan picked up a newspaper and began to read. The remaining 11 students filed in, ready for the econometrics class to begin. Lecturer Lee Gordon-Brown entered the room and after a quick greeting to students and acknowledgement of colleague Alistair Boast, handed back an assignment that students had completed recently. He then wrote a question on the board and began to try and start a discussion about it. 20 minutes or so went past and then everything changed. Alan stood up on top of his desk with his arms outstretched in front of him and screamed, You never understand me! And what do I have to do? He then pulled out his black CZ 9mm handgun and began firing. He first shot at 26-year-old William Wu, killing him instantly, and then shot Stephen Chan, also 26, who was sat next to William. Both men slumped in their seats immediately, dead. 
Students hit the floor, curling up under desks in fetal positions. The scene was a confusing mass of gunshots, screams and yelling from Alan. Seeming to have performed the killings he wanted to do, Alan then began firing haphazardly around the room, shooting lecturer Lee Gordon Brown in the thigh and the knee, student Daniel Urbach in the shoulder and the arm, student uh, Laurie Brown in the leg and abdomen, student Christine Young in the face, and finally hitting student Lee Dad Huyn in the hand. This required Lee to have his finger reattached in hospital later. Lee Gordon Smith's first thought was that the noises were from a nearby construction site, but noticing a shell casing hit the floor near him, he knew immediately what was happening, before realising that he had also been shot. By this point, Alan had fired 16 shots inside the lecture room and had emptied his clip. He needed to switch out his weapons. He stopped shooting and began rummaging in his jacket pocket. Lee Gordon Brown saw his chance and, despite his injuries, ran towards Alan, grabbing his hands as he reached into his jacket. Lee and Alistair Boast, who happened to be the head of the Monash University Kung Fu Club, tackled Alan, pinned him up against a wall, and Alan wriggled a couple of times, but he didn't really resist the two much stronger men. He said to Gordon Brown, Please don't kill me, Lee. The two men managed to get Alan to the floor. Lee Gordon Brown held Alan's wrists and arms, and Alistair Boast held both of his legs and his torso. Some students had managed to escape the room and raised the alarm outside the lecture room. This brought the incident to the attention of the Associate Professor of Economics, Brett Inder. Brett was in his office with a colleague when he heard the shots, and also thought they were from construction work nearby. When he heard screams from students and people yelling, He's got a gun! Brett immediately locked the door, and he called security. And as the bang stopped and the screams began to die down, Brett went to see what happened. Going past the mess of screaming students, Brett opened the door to the tutorial room and cast his eye over the scene of bodies and blood. In the corner of the room, Brett found Lee Gordon Brown and Alistair Boast restraining the gunman, pinning his arms and legs. Brett ran back out of the room and told his colleague to call police, and when he returned, Lee was calling for help. He was starting to weaken from his injuries, and he couldn't hold Alan much longer, and Alan was starting to struggle. Brett managed to insert himself into the group just as Lee collapsed to the ground beside him. Brett knew Alan, he'd had many conversations with the Bright Honors student over the past year. He talked to him softly, trying to reassure him that the ordeal would soon be over. It seemed like hours, but five or ten minutes went by. At one point, Brett realised Alan had the other pistols strapped to his waist and called another student, Bradley Thompson, over to remove them. Brett then exchanged observations with Lee, who was still lying close by on the floor. This is unbelievable, they said. How could this happen? Bradley Thompson, University Administrator Colin Thornby and student Andrew Swan provided first aid to shot and injured students still in the room. Lee Gordon Smith's tie was used as a tourniquet, ultimately saving his life. Alan continued babbling and speaking incoherently, but he wasn't putting up much of a struggle to Brett and Alistair, who remained on top of him. About half an hour after Alan started shooting, police arrived in the room, having worked their way carefully through each room of the Menzies building before arriving to the actual crime scene. The office immediately took Alan Zhang into custody. Altogether, Alan Zhang killed two people and injured an additional five. Police said that the quick response from Lee Gordon Brown, Alistair Boast and Brett Inder prevented something much worse, given the arsenal that Alan had on his person. Each gun could shoot 16 rounds, and Alan had five guns as well as a knife. So, um, my maths aren't good enough. You do your own maths. Alan was initially taken to the Glen Waverley Police Station, but was then transferred to the St Kilda Road Police Complex, where he was briefly questioned by Homicide Squad detectives with help from an interpreter. They quickly judged Alan to be unfit for an interview. Whilst being examined by Forensic Medical Officer Oswald Barkley that, later that evening, Alan wrote a note, I finally ended WW's life. Once again, WW referred to William Wu. Searching Alan's apartment, police found a further two Beretta pistols and firearm cleaning equipment, as well as the note that we mentioned early, the one that Alan left on that fateful morning. Alan's mother visited him at the police complex, and Alan told her he'd planned to commit suicide until Lee and Alistair subdued him. He then yelled, those two mad dogs at her, and she knew exactly who he was talking about. Alan came before the Melbourne Magistrates Court the day after the shooting. He was dressed in a blue jumpsuit, nursing a black eye. He kept his head bowed, sitting next to an interpreter. He was remanded without bail and did not speak during the process, before being charged with two counts of murder and five counts of attempted murder. 
The Supreme Court held the trial of Alan Zhang in June 2004. Directions hearings beforehand meant that the prosecution and defence had agreed that Alan was suffering from a psychotic episode at the time of the shooting, and was diagnosed with a paranoid delusional disorder. Prison psychologist Dr Bell said that Alan saw William Wu as an agent of evil who would destroy him academically, and that his actions on the 21st of October 2002 were focused on fulfilling what he saw as his responsibility and destiny to do, and he knew that he had to get rid of the William Wu's of the world and then to kill himself. Alan also asked Dr Bell to recommend the death penalty, which obviously isn't available in Australia anymore. Alan did not enter a plea on the trial. Witnesses were called, and after all of the evidence was heard, the jury took only half an hour to reach a verdict of not guilty, by reason of an impairment. Trial Justice Teague ordered that Allen be detained inside the Thomas Embling Psychiatric Hospital in Fairfield, it's a maximum security mental institution, for at least 25 years or until such time as his sanity and stability could be assessed and approved. Allen was 38 years old at the time. On the 22nd of October 2002, the day after the shooting, flags on Monash University's Clayton campus flew at half-mast and a graffiti artist wrote, Life is short, cherish your friends, love one another, RIP, on a campus billboard. On the first anniversary of the shootings, a day of reflection was held on the Clayton campus. There's now a memorial behind the campus's Matheson Library to the victims. Monash Student Association President Rebecca Tomlinson said that the university conducted a security audit in the wake of the shootings, as there was no evacuation procedure in place at the time. William Wu and Stephen Chan were both awarded posthumous uh, honours degrees by Monash University. Lee Gordon Brown, Alistair Boast, Brett Inder, Bradley Thompson, Andrew Swan and Colin Thornby all received bravery awards for their part in restraining Allen and helping injured victims. The Royal Humane Society of Australasia awarded Lee Gordon Brown the 2005 Stanhope Gold Medal, the highest Commonwealth award for bravery. In addition, the Society awarded him the 2004 Clark Gold Medal, and he was awarded the Star of Courage, the second highest award for bravery in the Australian Honours System. The Royal Humane Society also awarded Alistair Boast the Gold Medal of the Royal Humane Society of Australia. Bradley Thompson and Colin Thornby received Red Cross Community Hero Awards for their assistance after the shooting. Politicians took the time after the shooting to argue both for and against additional legal restrictions on handguns in Australia. The then Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, initiated another review of Australian gun laws, the last having been after the Port Arthur Massacre, after it was discovered that Allen had acquired his firearms legally. The Victorian State Government prepared new laws, doubling the punishment for misuse of handguns and introducing new laws against trafficking in handguns after the shooting, and all other states followed suit. The National Handgun Buyback Act 2003 put new restrictions on maximum calibre, magazine capacity and minimum barrel lengths for handguns held on a Category H Sport target shooting licence. This buyback scheme began in August 2003. In 2015, Allen attacked a female consultant psychiatrist with a knife at Thomas Embling Hospital, where he'd been incarcerated. Allen stabbed the staff member to the neck and hand on the 20th of October 2015, nearly 13 years to the day that he opened fire in the tutorial room at Monash University. Evidently, Allen had began making progress in the facility, having moved to the less secure Jasmine unit in 2013. Psychiatrist Yvonne Skinner had diagnosed Allen earlier in 2015 with chronic paranoid schizophrenia and found that he was distrustful of others. The stabbing victim, a consultant psychologist, was reading something Allen had given her when he stabbed her with a paring knife taken from the kitchen. He stabbed the woman once to the neck and at least twice in the hand when she raised her hand to stop the bleeding and then chased her as she ran off. Allen was then restrained by other staff members. Allen believed the worker were conspiring against him to deny him privileges and was preventing him from making contact with the family of one of his victims, William Wu. Allen also believed the staff member was conspiring with the Chinese and US governments to spy on him. Allen said later that he wanted to attack the victim for at least three years. Justice Dixon, who heard the short trial in place of a jury, agreed with prosecutors in the defence that Allen would not have known what he was doing was wrong and found it quite clear that Allen was mentally impaired at the time of the attack. Allen wore a yellow t-shirt underneath a navy blue suit as he sat in the dock, and Supreme Court Justice Jane Dixon found him not guilty of recklessly causing serious injury over the attack by reason of, again, mental impairment. He was handed an extra seven years to his sentence to be served concurrently. 
Alan Zhang will not be considered for parole until 2027, by which time he will be 61 years old. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also contact me on Instagram at Something About Murder, and I respond to every message. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. Bye. Yeah. Impairment. Encouragement.